everybody. Welcome into the Sportscaster and her son, where sports bridges the gap between the generations. I'm your co-host, 12-time Emmy Award-winning sportscaster, Peggy Kaczynski from ESPN Radio Chicago. I'm the mom, I'm the sportscaster, and I'm the baby boomer. And I am your other co-host, Jason Canander. I am now a junior at the University of Texas. There I am involved in Texas Week Television. We're recording our first show tonight. As you can see, it is Texas Game Week. First football game of the season. <laughs> this Saturday, football season's back. I'm excited. We're all excited. And uh, I am Generation Z. Thanks, everyone. You guys, our our views on YouTube are skyrocketing. Oh, so thank you, crazy. everybody, who has tuned in uh, to watch us here on the YouTube site. And those of you who are listening on the ESPN Chicago app, don't forget that we do have a website as well, uh, the sportscasterandherson.com. You can also find us on Facebook. Um, I mean, yeah, and merch. We'll, we'll, we promise you there will be some new merch coming to our store Dude. at T Public very soon. Soon. I'm excited about it. Crewnecks. And I was actually thinking with my new room, I have this nice blank wall back here above my bed. And I was thinking of making a flag with the logo and so a little promotion while while I'm on camera. Yeah, I love it. Oh, my gosh. Um, so in this episode, we are talking some Bears football. Training camp is over. The regular season is upon us. And the Bears have switched over not only a new general manager with Ryan Poles, new head coach Matt Eberflus, new defensive coordinator, new offensive coordinator, almost an entire new coaching staff. And they're switching over to a 43 defense, you know, so this is really, this is big because obviously under Matt Nagy, they had a three, four. So a lot expected from the linebacker play and with Roquan Smith back in the fold, though he did not play any preseason games, it'll be very important to focus in on the linebackers and the, the four guys up front. Yeah, it will be very interesting. And I actually think that the Bears have a better front seven than some people are probably assuming. Travis Gibson, in my opinion, is going to be one of the biggest breakout players in the NFL this year. Having Roquan Smith back is big. And he's missed a full preseason before his rookie year. And then he played that opening game against Green Bay. And didn't he sack Aaron Rodgers on the first play of the game? So I'm not too worried about Roquan Smith. But the linebackers are always super important. And something that was a Big time, big time, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Something that killed the Bears very often last year was their inability to tackle in the open field. And you see that a lot in teams that don't win is they can't make those open field tackles. A characteristic of Eberflus's defense with the Colts was the hustle plays, the tackling. He has the hustle system so that he, he knows that he has the guys that might not be the most talented, they might not be the hardest hitters, but they're going to make those big tackles. And the linebacker position is the most important for tackling in the NFL. So when I was talking to uh, the current Bears linebackers coach about teaching the 4-3, um, you know, I said, "Do you, would you ever tell these guys, hey, go watch some old film? And he says he doesn't have to do that because they already do it on their own. They talk a lot about Tony Dungy's um, creation of the defense uh, with the Tampa 2. Uh, they talk about um, Matt Eberflus coaching it in Dallas and with the Colts. And he goes in, of course, Lovey Smith. And we watch them, uh, have them watch Brian Urlacher and Lance Briggs. Jason, there's no one better to ask about coaching linebackers and uh, switching over from a 3-4 to a 4-3 than Bob Babich because he did coach two of the greatest linebackers in Bears history in Brian Urlacher and Lance Briggs. So, Coach Babich, thank you for joining us. How are you? Well, good morning, guys. I'm, I'm doing great and uh, excited to visit with you, you guys about those two players. Those are two of my favorite players that I've ever coached. And, you know, they make your job a lot easier coaching when you coach them like this. That's a good job right there. <laughs> you know, yeah, keep doing that right there. <laughs> you know, so that they were a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I want to ask you this, Bob. Um, does the player make the four three, or does the four three make the player? Well, I, I think that you know once you determine which type of scheme you're going to use defensively, you have to. There's a profile for each of the linebackers. So four three linebackers have a different profile 
than the three, four linebackers. So the four, three linebackers are more, they're in space a lot more. They're a lot more, um, I don't want to say necessarily athletic, but they have to be able to play in space and they, they're put in position to make a lot more plays. We're in a three, four, the middle linebackers, the outside linebackers are a lot of times rushers. So they just – they rush the quarterback a lot and they drop occasionally and that's not their forte. But the inside linebackers are more thumpers and bigger type guys that can play in space in the middle a little bit, but they're not put out there, removed from the core or anything like that. So I think the scheme dictates more what type of player you're looking for. So in Chicago, Roquan Smith, weak side linebacker, has played a, a three four since college at Georgia. He, we haven't seen him yet in any action, but all eyes are on him to see how he does converting to a four three. Are you familiar with Roquan? And, and what do you, what do you think we should be watching? What is going to be you know the most difficult or the easiest for him? Well. Uh... I studied Roquan. When he came out, I studied him hard. I uh, loved him. Uh, I think he's a fit for the system that Coach Eberflus is going to. I definitely think he's a fit for that. I think he's a player that can play in space. I think it's just going to be for him just getting uh, accustomed to the different alignments and the different spaces that he he's going to be as opposed to the 3-4. And uh, but he'll pick it up quick and, and he's going to be put in a uh, position to make plays and he is a playmaker. So um, I think it's going to be a great transition for him. I, I don't know him now, but from what I know from the past, when I studied him, when he was coming out of college, uh, he definitely, you know, fits the system. And I think he's a great player and, you know, looking forward to watching him and Coach Eberflus's, um system. How important is it to have a player like Roquan Smith on a roster like the Bears? You mentioned that the type of defense that you play kind of depends on the players that you have. Roster like the Bears, they don't have as many of these high-end defensive players. So how important is a guy like Roquan in the middle, big tackling linebacker? How important is he on a team like the Bears this season? Well, he, he's going to be an important part of what they're doing because he's one of their stars. And, you know, for you to win games, as, you know, Brian and Lance were both stars, we were fortunate to have too. Those guys, when we were winning games, they were making big plays, not just tackles and stuff like that. I think it's important that um, as a star that you make flash plays and, you know, picks, cause fumbles, tackles for losses, sacks, those type things. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that he has the ability to do that. So what sets a player like Roquan Smith apart from a player like a Lance Briggs or a Brian Erlacher, similar, similarly successful players, similarly able type of players, but Lance Briggs and Brian Erlacher were able to put together, turn it into wins on the field. So what sets those players apart from each other? Well, you know, once again, not knowing Roquan personally, but I think he has the same, you know, a uh, uh, skill set that is similar to those guys. Um, Brian and Lance, they were just, they were so instinctive and had such skills. Like Lance was a running back in college. So when he got an interception, you know, he took off and he ran with the ball. Brian returned punts in college. So when he was playing middle linebacker and they threw his, his hands, were they're the best hands that I've ever been around. Lance's were great too, but Brian's hands were like a wide receivers. And you know, most linebackers, you watch, you watch football, you know, from this point on, watch linebackers, they drop picks. Now they all say they could catch. If you ask them, <laughs> they'll be like, Oh yeah, I could catch. I'll say, Well, how many picks you got? Well, you know, two. And I'd say, Well, <laughs> you know, but um so I think that, you know, his ability to make splash plays is going to help them a lot. You know, and I'm not familiar with the rest of their personnel on the team or the rest of their linebacking core, but, um, you know, I'm familiar with him. And and I think he has a, a skill set that will allow – he's made uh, splash plays since he's been there, hasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Absolutely. He, yeah, he, he's a um, – I think he's he's going to love the system. I mean, Bob, you bring system. up a really good point, though. Um, 
how does the middle linebacker and the weak side linebacker in this system, how do they work off of each other? I know Brian was dropped back into space a lot. He he dropped back in coverage. And and Lance, we used to always say, Lance, you you got the sloppy seconds there. You got to pick up everything that, that Brian pushed your way. How does the middle linebacker and the weak side linebacker in the 4-3 work off of each other? Now, um, what what does Roquan play? Is he outside he's, linebacker? He's weak side. Okay, he's yeah. Lance Briggs. Okay. Yes, he's Lance Briggs. And and you know and, and I think Coach Eberflus is going to be very similar to uh, the coverages that we had when we were playing there. I mentioned to you, Peggy, to Coach Eberflus when he was at Missouri he used to come in and visit us. And then he was with Rod down in Dallas, and then he ran the system in Indianapolis. So I think our the system, the actual coverage is going to be very similar. So for, in the cover two system, the Mike linebacker, which is Brian, mm-hmm. he ran, he played deep a lot. Okay. He played deep a lot. And he was like, um, we called it deep middle run through. Lance, which is Roquan, he he played the underneath coverages. And what the main thing with them is that you set up on the quarterback. If you watch him, you set up on the quarterback, and when the quarterback's looking one way, you cheat that way. And when his hand comes off the ball, you break and all that. And a big part of this system, believe it or not, is the D line. The D line has to make the ball come out. Right. Because if I if the quarterback sets up and I'm cheating, and then there's no pressure, and I'm cheating this way, and then all of a sudden he throws it back there that it doesn't work then he needs once he sets up and looks he should never be further he should never be able to come back further than the middle of the field Mm -hmm. so that that's a big part of it it's on and then when they throw it you know it's all about your eyes it's not so much in man coverage your eyes are 100 percent on your receiver so you don't see the quarterback in match coverages which are you know in between what the uh, the bears are going to do and what uh, teams do in match, you're like 60-40 on your receiver and quarterback. But in the uh, Bears defense, you're 100% on the quarterback and you just take a peek to see where you're going. So the quarterback has a lot to do with how you're going to play and the D-line has a lot to do with how the quarterback's going to play. So it's all tied in together. You remember we had Israel and Adewale. And Tom yep. Harris. Well, Tommy Harris, it, yeah. one of the best three techniques that uh, I remember, his instincts, w- 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 he was like a cat in the middle. Well, listen to you, Peggy, talking like three <laughs> techniques and all that type of stuff. <laughs> I'll start giving you some calls. You can tell Coach Eberflus, hey, uh, when you were in this right here, why, why didn't you do this, this, and this? <laughs> but that, you know, that that all ties in together. And then the corners were big with forcing everything inside and stuff like that. So it's, you know, it's a system that's very dear to my heart. It's one that I believe in and um, will always be a believer in it. And, you know, it was very successful for us. So you said that Matt Eberflus, when you were at Missouri, um, he, he would come to tell me this again, when Matt Eberflus. Well, when Matt was at when Matt Missouri. Was at Missouri. Believe, now I'm old, so I believe he was at Missouri <laughs> at the time. You know, I just, you know, I forget some things now. But the University of Missouri staff, defensive staff would come up and visit with us and then we would talk to him about how we're running our defense so i believe he was running it at the university of missouri and then he got into the uh into the league with rod i believe i believe dallas was his first job yes so these things so you know that helped him get an acquaintance with rod you know, by coming up and stuff, I believe, you know, I yeah. think that's how it works. And that's what but they he said. Did come up. Yeah. They're, they're, the, the, some of the guys are watching old tape of Dallas and the Colts, obviously when Eberflus being there last year and um, the Tony Dungy, I mean, Tony. Oh yeah. Tony, he, Tony he's created the, it, right. Was it because yeah, of Derek he, Brooks? He's the, he's the godfather. It all started with the Pittsburgh Steelers way back when they were winning Super Bowls and Jack Lambert was the middle linebacker and all that type of stuff. And Coach Dungy played there and then coached there. And then when he got his head job, oh, oh no, he went as a coordinator, I believe, at Minnesota Vikings, and he implemented the system, and then that got him the head job 
you know, at Tampa Bay. And that's where Lovey and Rod and all those guys picked up the system. So I remember, you know, talking about it. I can't remember where I might have been at the University of Pittsburgh when Lovey and those guys said, Lovey, I was his graduate assistant. And so I knew him. So I think I was at the University of Pittsburgh and I went down and visited the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to, you know, learn about the system when I was in college, just like Coach Eberflus did. So that's kind of, you know, how it all evolved. I, I was actually just going to ask about your relationship with Lovey Smith. You and Lovey Smith go way back, as you just said. Lovey Smith is back head coaching for the Houston Texans this year. I think that there have been some misconceptions about his coaching ability. What do you think that Lovey brings to the table as a head coach in 2022 that other people maybe aren't assuming or expecting coming into this year? Well, the, the first thing is I'm the biggest fan of Lovey Smith, so I'm a little impartial. I really <laughs> am. I, I think that the guy, first of all, he has character off the field and he has football character. I love that part about him. I think that um, he's fair, but he's demanding. Um, I think the protect, perception sometimes is because he's not a loud, boisterous guy that he's not. He's demanding now. He's, you know, and I have an awful lot of respect for him. And, um, you know, something that I think that um, has gone wayside a little bit. There's two types of coaches. There's guys that love fundamentals and play fast and play physical. Then there's guys that love the scheme. You know, I'm going to blitz you here and all that type of stuff. And I've always been a proponent of, hey, uh, give the guys a little menu. Let them play fast. Let them play free, which allows them to play physical and allows big plays. And, you know, I think that's, you know, what uh, Coach Smith does. And, you know, nobody knows this defense better than Coach Smith. And the Houston Texans are going to surprise a lot of people this year. You said that there are those two types of coaches. Which type of coach would you say Matt Eberflus is? I would say he's on our side. Not, not on our side. Yeah, <laughs> it's not no. us against them. But he's – he's he's uh, now, once again, okay, I think Matt was still doing the same thing in Indianapolis. Yes. But he's part of the system that we all grew up in. Rob Marinelli, Bob Babbage, Lovey Smith, Tony Dungy, you know, all those guys. And um, he's hes definitely a part of that system. And I, I believe he's a part of the, uh, you know, small menu. And then Allen, um, the defensive coordinator. Allen Williams, brought, yep. Yeah, he brought him. He's a good guy, too. He's a great guy, too. Love him. Um, he brought him to bring the same type of philosophy in that he's had. That's why he brought him there, you know. So when Allen's been a big part of that, I think he was uh, in many, Minnesota with um, Leslie Frazier and that mm-hmm. was part of the system. And, you know, so he's been a part of the system for a long time also. With these offenses that have been airing it out, and um, how is it that the the defense has lasted and still works against some of these high powered offenses today? Well, because I think the core fundamentals are solid. I think they protect you against everything, and um, I think you have to. And I'm sure Coach Smith and Coach Eberflus and all these guys have tweaked this system a little bit. You have to, mm-hmm. you know. A little bit, but the core fundamentals and the core principles, they're they're solid. They're solid as rock. It's like when you have a family, you know, you got these core principles for you. I'm sure your mom, Jason, had some core principles for you that you better abide by. And, you know, then as time started changing, you you know, as a parent, you start change, tweak it a little bit. But there's those core fundamentals and principles and you know, I think that they hold strong versus anything that you see. Anything else, Jace? No, that's really all that uh, that comes to mind. Actually, you know what? I, you were just with the Buffalo Bills. How do you defend against Josh Allen and an offense that explosive? <laughs> How happy Listen, are you, you that you look, didn't Look have at to. you trying to get all the details well, out. Well, no, so I want to tell you with hey, Josh God. Allen as my quarterback. So I'm, I'm very, very interested to hear about hey, this. Let me tell you what. Okay, the first thing, Jason, you wouldn't believe how big he is. Wow. He's huge. I, I think he's 6'5", 245. You know, he doesn't look at on TV. but And he's so mobile. And um, he's, his skill set is off the charts. He could take over a game and win a game. 
I mean, I have the utmost respect. And Peggy, you'll appreciate this. He has Brian Erlacher's personality where everybody on the team loves him. Really? He's the guy. Oh, yeah. He, he's, I have nothing but great things to say. I don't use the word great very often, but Josh Allen is legit and um, just a great guy. Big, strong, athletic. Did you see um, uh, he played, you know, my son coaches the linebackers there just now. I was going to say Bobby does. Yeah, yeah, Bobby coaches. How about that, Peggy? I don't know if you ever met him, but he's coaching the linebackers now. So I watched the game, their last game. I can't remember who it was against, once again, a goal. But uh, Josh got in there the first series, just boom, 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 and his touchdown. He kind of scrambled around a little bit, threw a dart 28 yards across the field, just bam, put it right there. And his arm strength is unbelievable. Like, I think the first game he started was against many, uh, Minnesota. We were up there. We were big underdogs. And he took off running. And they came to tackle him, and he jumped over the guy, landed on his feet, and kept running. And we we ended up winning by a big score. And that's just, you know, and he's gotten better and better, and he's ultra competitive, super competitive. You know, so well, he, I, I gotta really I gotta good. ask you um two things now since uh since you worked with your son and I do a show with my son, uh. <laughs> Did you ever get to the point where you're just rolling your eyes, looking at him and thinking, how many times have I told you this? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the bad thing with me, Peggy, is my son's a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> so I it's a bad thing know, with her, football too. Wise, <laughs> football wise, you know, it was hard. To, he, he's really, I'm so proud of him, you know, and like I said, Cameron Turner. Ron Turner's son is my son-in-law, and that's where we are right now in Arizona. And Cameron's the pass game coordinator for the Arizona Cardinals and the quarterback coach. Yeah. You know, so we're a football family. And, um, you know, both those guys have bright futures. And, you know, Bobby's daughter, I can't believe she's 14 years old. She just went to the, a camp at Ole Miss oh my gosh. for softball. I mean, I'm just getting old. Wow. But, um, you know, so it's just – so it's great. It was great to work with him in our profession and probably your profession. Also, you don't get to work with your children very often. So I was with him five years. And for my wife, it was the best thing ever. We had two grandchildren there. She actually became a lunch lady at their school. You Aww. know, so it, it was just it was just the best thing. You know, I love it. Before yeah. we let you go, um, tell us your your favorite Brian Erlacher and Lance Briggs uh, team meeting behind the scenes. Some, I mean, they used to, they used to really get you on some jokes, some, some they, practical they, they, jokes. They are, they're the best. I mean, they were like my children. We were together nine years. How about that? Wow. Nine years every day in the meeting room, you know, they knew when I was having a bad day, I knew when they were having problems, you know, it, it was really a cool thing. Uh, a funny story with Lance is, um, Early in my career, I was a blurter. So on the sideline, I would yell stuff. And you shouldn't do that because the players, they should be out there playing free. So we were playing Green Bay. And I yelled, hey, Lance. Hey, Lance. And he turned around and they snapped the ball. And uh, he got smashed by the lineman because he was looking at me. So he came off. He was yelling, Bob, Bob, you can't do that. You got to quit blurting. I was like, okay, okay. I, I'm sorry. I won't do it anymore. You know, <laughs> you know, and then uh, with Brian, you know, um, we were playing um, the Carolina Panthers. Okay. This, I can't remember. It was like 2006, 2005. And we, there was this one defense where we all out blitzed when it, when an offense gave us a certain formation, we would check that it's all out blitz and it was really successful for us. And so I was on the sideline. I was like, Hey, love him. Um, I said, they're doing this. We need to check to this. We can get it. He goes, no, we ain't, we're not doing that because you know, we're winning and this quarterback can't beat us. And we ain't doing it. Time out. Brian Erlach comes up. Hey, love you. They're, they're going four out of the court. Can we go to the bliss? Boom. He goes, Oh yeah, go ahead. I looked at him. I was like, I just, and this is what love. He said, this is still a lie. He goes, Bob, 
face of the franchise, Bob Babbage. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome dude. oh that's brian cool. loved it i was like let me you know brian was there the whole time i was like oh, yeah, i just told you that he's like no 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 that's good go ahead brian. <laughs> that's oh, great that's fantastic there's so many stories those i dudes, know they, they, we used to come in our meeting room those guys had so much fun i'm talking about the team we'd come into our meeting room and all the desks would be piled up and they'd be taped with uh the white tape all the way around, the D lineman would come in and, um, you know, as a joke, they'd put all our desks stacked on top and then tape them all together. <laughs> and they would get mad, you know, so oh. it, those were good times. Yeah, they yeah. sure were. Well, we're, we're hoping that the Chicago Bears uh, can get back to a defense like that, like the days that you were there, Bob. Hopefully, Roquan Smith is as successful as Lance Briggs was as well. And we can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us on the show to, to help us understand what we should be looking for with this defense and also to kind of reminisce about some of the great times. Yeah, that's some good times. But I'll tell you what, I do have the utmost respect for Coach Evers. He's a great coach. I think he's going to do a great job. And, you know, I'm going to be pulling for him. Thank you, Bob. Great. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You know, that is the most Bob Babich has talked um, when he was linebackers coach. I mean, we would, we we had access to him, but he was so loyal to those guys in that linebacking room that he would never reveal anything. Uh, it's great to hear him and really interesting, too, just hearing about the comparisons of Roquan Smith and how he studied him back when Roquan was at Georgia um, and, and the potential that Roquan has in this defense. I think that's really good to hear. You know, I'm also really glad that we talked about Lovey Smith and the parallels can be drawn between Eberflus bringing his own system and his own guys with him to Chicago a lot like Lovey did because I think what the Bears are looking to do is to recapture some of those glory days with Lovey Smith. That's the closest they've been to a Super Bowl in my lifetime. So I would hope that the Bears are looking to do the same thing. And it was so nice listening to fun stories about the defense. And it's so, like such a polar opposite from everything that we just heard with the Nagy regime. So it like really makes you want the bears to be good again Ugh. i know i know it's awesome all right um do you have any predictions this uh this time yeah. around here Jason? oh my gosh i mean this is like golden era for sports right now we have the mlb season is coming to an end which we're going to talk about in a minute here we have college football starting nfl starting so i've got one prediction for each first of all Texas is back. Maybe not so much. I'm going to talk about this on student television tonight as well. But my first prediction is I'm going to go on the record here and make my Texas football prediction. They're going to go nine and three in the regular season. They'll make the Big 12 championship. And I think that they will win the Big 12 championship, miss out on the playoffs. But 10 and three, that's not too bad for a team that went five and seven with a loss to Kansas last year. So I, I'm pretty high on Texas this year, pretty high on Texas every year, though. Um, I'm allowed to be a little biased towards them on this show since it's a Chicago sports show. So I'll take what I will. My second prediction is for the NFL season. We just talked Josh Allen with Bob Babbage, which was amazing to hear a defensive coach speak so highly of an offensive player. We always hear about how those two sides of the ball are usually at, like, at ends um, of the locker room, but to hear him praise Josh Allen like that was awesome, and I'm actually going to ride it and say that Josh Allen wins his first career MVP trophy this season. I'm high on the Buffalo Bills. They are my Super Bowl prediction this year. Josh Allen was awesome last year, best dual threat quarterback in the NFL, in my opinion. His offense didn't get any worse. Fun division in the AFC East, so Josh Allen MVP. And number three, this pains me, my Chicago White Sox. I released my official statement of sort of throwing in the towel for this season on the White Sox yesterday uh, amid so much pressure from my friends, both here and at home. I had to say something, and um, my prediction is that whatever the right thing to do, the White Sox just won't do it. Because, and, and what I mean is that Tony LaRusso will be back next year. Tony will be back next year. I do not think that this is going to come to an end this year because I was very, very sure that Tony's time with the White Sox wouldn't end unless he stepped down. And that was totally proven right this year because there were so many opportunities where you would think that he had very much deserved to be fired and they could have saved the season by firing him. 
but it was clear that he kind of has the final say in his status. So I can't see a guy with like Tony La Russa going out like this. Um, but I do think it only gets worse from here. So that's my third prediction is that uh, times are tough in the south side. And yeah, it has stunk. But I don't think that the White Sox are going to do what literally everybody watching every game knows they should do. And it sucks because Tony La Russa is a great guy. I actually really enjoyed meeting him last year. Wow. That, I'm a little stunned at that. Um, all right. So in, in lieu of my final thoughts, you have an idea for a new segment called Let's Talk. And yeah. tell me I'll, what this is about. I'll explain it. So okay. my idea for this segment is it seems like there are so many things that pop up every week on Twitter, especially where it's there. there are two sides of the debate. And it happens with sports a lot too, where it's sort of, there's this old fashioned way of looking at things or thinking of things. And then there's this new school approach. And those two sides seem to collide a lot on Twitter because Twitter is the common ground for people my age breaking through in media, people my age that are sports fans, and then people your age who are established members of the media Mm -hmm. or people your age who are just sports fans, always on the opposite ends of the spectrum. So my idea with this segment is that we talk about something that sort of transcends the generational views, something where your generation would probably think differently than mine does. And we talk about it and see if we can come to a common ground. So have at it. So my first my first topic that I want to talk about, and we're going to do one topic per show for this. Originally, I had an idea, but then something even bigger happened over the weekend. And by big, I mean a several foot flag saying sell the team at the White Sox game. It was behind home plate at one point. It was in right field at one point. This is something where I think 10 years ago, if this happened, it would have been like super headline news because that's a big no-no flashing something like that on TV, flashing any statement on TV. But it didn't 10 years later, 2022, it didn't really even catch that much steam in Chicago. And the steam that it did catch was positive steam. People thought it was a good thing. People thought it was good publicity to sell the White Sox. What do you think about that? About the flag itself being seen on TV? On I'm, television. I'm, I'm stunned. I'm, I'm stunned by it because most leagues and teams will say it's our right to have you take down any offensive signs that you bring in. And quite typically, you would go out there and say, get the ushers, they got to take that sign down. And the That's fact what that ended it, up happening, by the way. Right. But then it sure took a while. It sure took a while for it to happen. I'm a little, I'm I'm uh, a bit surprised. Uh, I think that when it, you you pay for the rights to to your um, broadcast group that is going to show your games, your it's your stadium that you can pretty much make the rules. And I am really really stunned that it got by. Now, so here's here's my really quick counter counter argument to that. The other side of this is that's somebody who. We all we know paid for at least one ticket, but maybe has been paying for tickets for games across the course of the season and is obviously displeased with the White Sox. There isn't any rule to my knowledge that you can't write something that about that obviously isn't vulgar or, or obscene, voicing your displeasure for the team. That's so sort of like what you said. Do you think the White Sox are making up their own rule on the spot? Do you think they reserve the right to do that? Because I didn't see any problem with the sell the team flag unless the people that that the flag's view was obstructing had a problem with it. Otherwise, I think that it's totally fine. Oh, I think that, no, I think that the team has every right to say you have to take it down and that you cannot, uh, we don't like what it says. I think it's that simple. I think it's that simple. Fair enough. All right, let's talk about 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 it. it. All right, good idea, Jason. I love it. Um, I think it's going to stick. I like it too. Good. Nice episode. This was fun. It was great talking football, uh, bringing some optimism to the Chicago Bears because not a lot of national um, people are giving them too much optimism. Uh, (laughs) I I think that I think these coaches can coach. I think we've seen a huge jump in the preseason and sure it's not, uh, you know, starting lineups yet. But uh, I think that I think we're going to see some things that will make people happy this season. So I'm looking forward to it. 
I just, I'm hoping to see more effort and energy out of this year's Bears. And that's what I think the new coaching staff is going to bring. That has been the most optimistic of everything I've been hearing from Eber Flutes has been how he really prioritizes hustling and, and making those tackles. And that was everything that the Bears were lacking under Nagy. It was just dumb mistakes. The the things that the fans at home can correct. It yep. drives me crazy. So Hustle, intensity, takeaways, and smarts. That's hits. the hits yep. principle. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, who has followed us on our YouTube YouTube channel that is watching us right now. Uh, please don't forget to check out some of our past episodes. Uh, you can also find some past episodes audio wise on Apple Podcasts if you search ESPN Chicago Podcasts, because that is the home of our audio version of the show, ESPN Chicago app. Continue to download, follow, tell a friend, and uh, we're excited to, to have a new home. Yeah, and uh, don't forget to follow our brand new Twitter. That's where you can find the latest clips, latest updates, teases, merch, everything for the show. It is at T-S-A-H-S pod. That is just the acronym for our show and then pod. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's starting to ramp it up a little bit more. So make sure that you follow it and uh, don't miss out on anything about our show. It's going to be a fun, fun, fun football season. Oh, I'm so excited. So glad that it's back. The White Sox have been disappointing me so much. Just need need like... Just need sports, like positive sports, though, because it's been miserable the past few months. Our thanks to our guest, Bob Babich, who is retired NFL coach, formerly of the Bears, the Bills, the Chargers. The, where else? Rams. 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 The Rams. With okay. Smith, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. With Lovey Smith. Um, thank you to Bob Babich for joining us. And thank you to our producer, Jake Cantu at ESPN Chicago. And Jason, we'll talk maybe next week. And thank everyone else for uh, joining us. Yeah, thanks y'all for joining us. Follow me on Twitter, follow my mom on Twitter, follow our show on Twitter, and we're looking forward to the fall. Glad to have y'all with us. Until next time, everyone, so long.